she's the product of it because she knows this stuff. Not only that, when you start reading more closely, it says she says that when her her you know Hassan was when they were negotiating the arrangements, um, the father tests him in Talmud without which he's not going to he's not going to be any Hassan of hers, a bridegroom of hers, but also wants to know if he knows German, and he doesn't. And the father, this Talmud scholar, says you need to learn German. You need to learn German. Mm -hmm. And the Hasidim that he's married agree. How does he learn German? She teaches him. So you think this woman's walking around with a little bit of guilt, maybe? Like, uh, like a heavy dose of guilt? Remember what she says? I mean, she leaves so much out. Three kids, no grandchildren. I can tell you other stuff she leaves out, but that'll give you an idea. Pretty bizarre what she leaves out. She puts in this little remark that her father, I believe it, said upon hearing that she gave up a kosher kitchen. If my pestle did it, it was because she had to. Now, why did she put that in, do you think? She's She is overwhelmed with guilt. And this is absolution from her father. She even says, right before she records that, she says, what will my parents think of me? I used to be their traditional daughter. And look what I've come to. And then a few paragraphs later, she quotes her father for giving her. So I think the whole memoir is about absolution. I mean, it's about other things. It's not one thing, but that's one. And by embedding her personal story in the larger cultural one, that's how she gets it. It's not just me. This is what was going on. I could not resist this. These forces were overwhelming. What that produces for us, however, is a memoir that's so much more interesting because of the coupling of memoirs of the grandmother with scenes from the cultural history of the ninth, of 19th century Russian Jews. And between the two of them, we get a hell of a lot more of the latter than the former. You mentioned that after her husband died, she didn't seem to go back to I don't know. wearing right. or Well, kosher, she doesn't. That we know. Or a kosher... Kitchen. I don't know what From she did in her kitchen. So that I don't know. She doesn't say. Perhaps her husband, she used in a way, her husband is an excuse to move forward and therefore her incorporating that comment about if my uh, Hespola did it, she's trying to work out her decision not to go back. Well, I don't know. I mean, clearly the head covering she didn't do. But this is she that right. wasn't obligated to as a non-married woman. A a traditional, in, oh, in the oh, traditional oh. world, even divorced women keep covering their hair. It depends on... I, mean, I suppose it depends. But Where was she living after he died? That's a good... I mean, mostly in, in Minsk, but she moves around a lot. She's in Germany, too. She moves around. She, you know, I've got letters from her, from her archive, where she's in Heidelberg, she's in Berlin. She's is there any Minsk. indication, it uh, wouldn't have been in the memoirs, but other materials that you know, the, these other more radical transformations, you know, you have the Zionist emergence of that, but also the revolution in 1905, before 1905, um, the world really beginning to shake itself up in very powerful ways. Does that come into her? She world? wants to get out of Russia. I know that not from the memoirs, but from letters. She's desperate to get out of it. She does. She wants to come to the United States, actually. But out of there. Yeah. Was there ever an opportunity for her to leave sooner than that? Like, you know, when the mass, a lot of the mass immigration was before 1904. So she never mentioned about wanting to leave with or without a husband? She doesn't, um, she doesn't talk about it in the memoirs, but it comes out from letters. And there was really no opportunity to go? Well, she does go to Germany for a while. I mean, she's got, a, she's got sisters in Germany, and she oh. does spend significant time there. And they do help her. I mean, talk about room of one's own, literally. They're, they're, they're wealthy, I mean, one of them in particular. And she talks about the table that her sister Kathy provided for her, and how they used to, you know, remember these stories and laugh and cry about them and whatever. And that's literally a room of one's own. But there were others, there were men. Do we know culturally, about, very important men who supported her. Do we know about descendants? Are there any? Yeah, I mean, I corresponded with them. And they're totally similar. Totally all of them. Though I think there are some there are some in Israel that I've tried to like I haven't succeeded yet. So 
you know, maybe with this last more recent migration of uh, Russian, there are some descendants in Israel. I don't know what their story is, but. With all this turmoil with pogroms and the wars and, and um, Tsarist Russia and Soviet Union and the like, how does all this survive? How does, how does what survive? How does, <laughs> not the, just her memoirs, but her letters and letters. moving around so much and the like, how, how, the, how does she warn and archive that survives? It, it, it's, it's in St. Petersburg. Tons of it. Her <laughs> stuff, his stuff. He was, a, he was a banker and a member of the city council of Minsk. Apparently, there's a ton of stuff it is. I've been doing this the rest of my life if I get there, so I'm not doing it. But there's a ton of stuff. And then she, all of these kids, um, not all of them, but some of them, I mean, one of them was a very significant writer, two of them significant writers, and they have archives, and it's all there. It's also there. A lot of stuff. Is there a museum in St. Petersburg? No, it's in the archive. There's a, there's a, a Pushkin, Pushkin, it's called Pushkinsky Dome. Where is that located? Uh, in in uh, St. Petersburg. Oh. Pushkin, the Pushkin Archive, it's called. The Pushkin Literary Institute or something like that. It's a big archive and they got her stuff. Okay. How long have you or whomever been aware of this? I mean, when did this memoir kind of Great question. I became aware of it I mean, many, many, many years ago. Um, I was, was my, my first job teaching Jewish history in a rabbinical school, actually, and I wanted to, um, I wanted to teach Jewish women's history, the whole history of the Jews is presented as men's history one way or the other. So I was looking for stuff. And um, Lucy Davidowitz has a marvelous collection that I recommend to all of you called The Golden Tradition. She's got a very good introduction and then the whole book is translated excerpts from letters and diaries and memoirs. And this was it. And um, I was, you know, it's, it's very dramatic stuff. And I said, now at that point I was working on my dissertation. I just, you know, I was teaching full time and dissertating full time. I just want to survive this and then I want to read that. That's how I became aware of it. Mm -hmm. So it, it was there. You know, people in the people who do like Russian Jewish history know, you know, knew of it. Oh, I guess that was my next question. So like aside from you, like are, is this now a pretty well known <laughs> I Googled it, and there were about 12 pages. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there was a, an edition that came out that's abridged, and obviously it was mine. That's out. <laughs> but, um, but mine's in the press, though. So. Who wrote the uh, caption on the picture, and what's the, the missing date? The, the, uh, it's the, grands, the grandson. The grandson. And it's... I it says, know, I saw her in 1917. I saw her in 1917. She died uh, in 1917. That's strange, because I... And photo is 19... I don't know what it is. It's missing. Um, I don't know if I can, I would have to look at it at home, because I, I have the, no, actually I said. So that's one of the, I mean, that's the last years of her yeah. life. What? Yeah. It's just before she dies. Yeah. yeah, right, well, I mean, she looks at it. I don't, you know, it's well, actually, I saw good. her in 1917, and everybody says she died in 1917. She looks good. Did you resist first um, In various places, but he ended up in the United States. Well, he could probably have gone to see her in 1917. Well, unless he was in Russia. He was there. Yeah, he, he might not have been here yet. Yeah, he wasn't uh, here yet. I think he came in the, in the 20s. Oh, no, he, he was there then. He was born there. Yeah. I think the, the, the inability to get into college is so interesting because in Poland at around the same time, they had the numerous clauses. Yeah, well, that's, it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, but. It's the same board, it's same pay for a Gentile and Fury. Right, right. It's the same because it was part of, you know, but they could, Russian they law. But they could afford it to send their son and a Gentile, but they chose not to. Um, I mean, my grandfather sent four of his sons to college paying to medical school. To college school, or to gymnasium? Medical school. Yeah. After gymnasium to medical school. Right, and in other words, if you understand the tactic, what Jews would do is that there was there was a quota. So you would pay for a non-Jew because then it would open up a spot right. for you and then, right? She talks about it, she mm -hmm. mentions it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the way she depicts it, he went and did it. It's not like they, he came home and said, hey, you know, you want to pay for, for yeah. somebody, or he mm -hmm. just did it. Yeah. Yeah. He was a prime for mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think this was wonderful, and uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to, to learn so much about a subject that, that we know very little. 
Um, thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope